Welcome to Turning the Page, Lexington Public Library's podcast where we discuss library happenings, take a behind the scenes look at different parts of the library, and of course, book recommendations and author interviews. I'm your host, Jennifer. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Erin. <laughs> How are you today? I'm good. I'm excited to talk about some poetry with yes. you. Yes. Yes. Um, unfortunately, we didn't hit April. <laughs> no, which was National Poetry Month. <laughs> which we missed. But I think there's still a time for us to talk poetry. Yes. Poetry is all the time, not just in April. That's true. Let's let's get more poetry people out. Yes. And buy, get some books. <laughs> yes. Do not restrain yourselves to April, people. Yes, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we're going to talk some poetry. Um, I guess this this is going to be a little snippet of us talking about some of the things, how we got started reading poetry, yes. what we're reading, uh, kind of what our, what our, I guess, our favorite type of poetry is. Um, or poets, um, and just give an overview uh, and a little bit about the library's collection um, and about um, that we are buying new titles. So. Yes. All right. So I'll start off. My biggest exposure to poetry beyond Shel Silverstein, who we <laughs> can talk about in a second, was through just being very interested in Greek and Roman mythology and to the point that I actually did a classics degree double oh. major with biology in college which was a lot and <laughs> i'm just yeah i'm trying to put that in my mind right now yeah <laughs> well one was i had intentions to do like veterinary pharmacy something like that okay mostly to satisfy my family and the classics was just for me because i, I enjoyed you. it um so i have a lot of experience actually translating epic poetry, um, specifically oh, wow. the, the Iliad and the Aeneid, um, some of the Odyssey, but it has always been very fascinating. These long, long works of verse that are put down, but were originally spoken. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the oral traditions and how rhythms form as you speak has always been really fascinating to me. Is, is there poetry like that being written now? Do people write epic poems still i would imagine that they do i don't have a lot of exposure to it if they do um but i'm sure that i would like it if yeah they did. i guess it's just you know interesting because well, I, I oral, uh, of course um so there is a teen series that is completely escaping me and i will think of it i'm sure at three in the morning <laughs> but it's written in verse the, oh, okay the whole thing it's it's really super deep hard topics but it's softened somehow by being oh. in verse it makes it much more accessible to people maybe that are going through those issues um they were very popular back in like 2008 2009 when i worked with teens um oh, wow. i will look up the author here in a second and I know that's ellen hopkins yes crank and yes Werther. i remember those yes. i remember that series um yes i remember that series um, so I think it, uh, that type of type of prose, I guess, um, in children's lit is still being used, yes. um, which I think is really great. And I think if you have a reluctant reader, for sure, um, and, and your kid, you want your kid to sort of like branch out from graphic novels, which I would say, keep letting them read graphic novels For sure. yeah. if <laughs> uh, but you know readers, let them read whatever they want to read they will be less reluctant the less pressure they have yes and that's very true so uh, the so parents out there let your kids read some graphic yes, novels read for fun and then the read for purpose will come later yes it's a good way to like have them get a certain amount of um confidence yes it's something maybe it's heavy but then they're able to read it and it's not long and mm -hmm. they can get through it and so yeah um i would suggest that which you know yes. so yep. just a um, little tip for from us out there yes absolutely and i uh, just noticed here when i was looking up ellen hopkins that jason reynolds 2017 book was in long, verse it's long yeah, way, long way down. down which i thought was great they also made that into a graphic novel. Yes. <laughs> well, verse lends itself well to adaptation. Yes. Um, 
because it's already in kind of a rhythm. And so it's easy to break that rhythm apart into chunks that work with images. Yeah, that's true. So it just kind of fits. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah. So um, what part of the Iliad is like your favorite? Is there like a part in this epic trail that our story that um, really grabs you? Um, I just, I really enjoy Achilles and his bad attitude. <laughs> yes. Like, he is just the the worst, almost. <laughs> like, his attitude is just so bad. You know, he, for most of the book, he's refusing to fight. And so it's yes. about the various generals and leaders trying to get him to fight. And then he has his relationship with Patroclus. And once Patroclus dies, a multi-thousand-year-old spoiler. Um, <laughs> By the way. <laughs> uh, he gets so upset that he attacks a river. And the so the gods have to step in <laughs> and, like, stop him from actually bringing huge destruction when – What's really trying to be solved is who's the prettiest goddess of them all. Wow. Okay. So, yes, it's very, it's a very interesting, and I can see how around a campfire over many, many nights, like it would be very engaging oh, yeah. to follow and keep up when, like, what's that Achilles going to get up to this episode? Oh, yeah. Like a cereal. Like, yeah. you know, you're, yeah. That also reminds me of like um, today's life when you're a kid or a teen Mm -hmm. and it's you that's like, who's the cutest girl at school and who's the cutest guy at school. (laughs) You never answer that question. No. (laughs) Just never answer that question. Yeah. Just, mm, no. It's not worth it. It's not. Troy fell because of that question. (laughs) You'll fight a river. You don't want to fight a river. I mean, come on. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah. So for me, um, I guess I started off reading, of course, Shell Silverstein, yeah. um, and Roald Dahl's uh, Revolting Rhymes. Um, my mom was a big reader of that type of stuff for me. Um, when I was a really little kid, my mother purchased a book for me called 365 Days of 365 Stories or something like that. And it had rhymes. It had, um, some poetry and it had story and it was illustrated and written by Richard Scarry, who to this day, I still love Richard Scarry. Yeah. Um, but I think that kind of turned me on to being very interested in rhymes. Yeah. Um, and I think most, a lot of children are like that, but I just remember being like, Hmm, can I do that? You know, like, Hmm. And then just trying to take a word and like rhyme it as far as I could. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a way, you know, um, it kind of kept, kept me forward. And of course, then, and I, and then of course I went to my moody uh, teenager years <laughs> and of course then fell in love with Sylvia Plath, Ariel, which I must have reread a million times. And of course the bill jar, <laughs> not poetry, but still. Um, so I think poetry, I think poetry helps us in periods of time in our life at least for me, um, that expresses a certain amount of, of feelings mm-hmm. that maybe we can't express and read something on the page that really you go, oh, my gosh, that's exactly how I feel. Yeah, and like it's a big emotion in yes, a, very big a em- possibly little chunk. Yeah, or someone feels the same way I do mm-hmm. or that experience that's being – portrayed in this poem is something that I felt but never said out loud. So there's something about poetry that's very important to me and in, in that uh, for that reason. You know, someone like Mary Oliver, who I think has expressed so many emotions for me, uh, and I think for other people, yeah, I think, gosh, what would, you know, like um, you're going through something, I would think, I'm sure Mary Oliver has a poem about this, you know, as I laugh to myself, like, oh, yeah, I should probably check and see. So let's talk about Shel Silverstein, since we both have Yeah, let's talk about Shel Silverstein. Mentioned him. So his poems for children are so creepy, but they're, like, in that zone of delightfully creepy. Yes, and gross, but kids love gross. Yes. 
And kids love a little bit of creepy. Uh, yeah. If I had a, you know, a dime for every kid that wants a scary story. Yeah. Um, I'd be rich. <laughs> but, uh, you yes. know. Um, I'm not taking money from children. <laughs> no, no. I don't, I don't I actually give Jennifer dimes. <laughs> yeah. I don't. Yeah. And probably what grabbed a lot of a lot of kids mm-hmm. in our, you know, generations of children is that it's kind of funny. Yeah. And so you could laugh, you know, you would think, is this like, oh, this is kind of crazy. You know, like, yeah. this is funny, you know. Like I read, I probably started reading them around fourth grade, eight or nine, something like that. Yeah, that's like probably that. about how old I was as well. And I have Ladies First <laughs> has always been just like slightly at the back of my mind where they meet the cannibal king and she's like, ladies first. And <laughs> just in my head, it just every so often I go, ladies first. And then just get kind of like, ooh, creepy. <laughs> but it, it's so powerful. It just sticks in there. And I'm sure that there are other examples of folks that, you know, read their Shel Silverstein, where the sidewalk ends, any of them, and something just stays. Oh, there's no doubt. I, I, of course, for me, I'm, I can't think of... I just remember having the book. I could tell you what the illustrations looked like. I could tell you what the mm-hmm. cover looked like. Um, yeah, it was. it really was memorable. And, you know, to this day, I mean, people are... Kids are still reading these yeah. poems. You know, and then... I don't know how universal this is, but memorizing Annabelle Lee to recite in uh, eighth grade, you have to, the Poe poem, you just, it just stays, little chunks of it every so I, often. That's, uh, yes. I, and I still love that poem. It's so good. Yeah. I love Poe. I like how creepy, just yeah, he delightful. He he knew what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> so atmospheric, you know, mm-hmm. like you just, you just. In a kingdom by the sea. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. I. Yeah, you can't go wrong with Poe. I yeah, and that's so funny you said that because I remember being in oh gosh, I remember maybe in sixth grade, seventh grade, as having to like memorize poems and Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, and then you're thinking you think you can never you're never gonna get it. It's just you never just, gonna happen. And then all of a sudden it's just like boom, you got it. Yeah. You know, and you can't believe it. <laughs> you're like, I finally did it. And you're like, let me do it now so I can remember. Yes, and then like twenty years later, you're walking around, and, and you go, suddenly you just start reciting. <laughs> you're like, "Wait a minute, let me tell you." Yes, <laughs> I love it. I love it. And you know, there's. I think poetry is a good way to teach certain skills. Yes. Um. I mean, we we know that sort of like the idea of rap, um, mm-hmm. of kind of helps. I mean, I remember a period of time where learning sort of math skills was was wrapped to us um and so i remember thinking i can still remember that you know so Mm -hmm. i think just the it just rhyme is just one of those things and not not all poetry is going to rhyme of course but um and i think it's just i think it's just a a really great important thing for us to Look, still look at it and and, and mm-hmm. see that there's people who are still expressing themselves and writing some like amazing poetry for sure. Um, and I think even you know, say what you will about social media, but I think Instagram has been really good for poets. poetry. Yeah, yeah, because you can. In an image, you can set it, you know, with an aesthetic that you want that helps inform the reader what right. kind of vibe you're going for, but also it is a way to just reach an audience that maybe wouldn't say pick up a poetry volume, but they will stop and read an image. Yeah. And that's so true. Um, I think about how a period of time um, talking about the sort of this Instagram poets or whatever Mm -hmm. you want to call them um, that would go on and self publish and be, um, sort of make a name for themselves. Yeah, be very successful doing so. Yeah, and so, of course, um, so thinking about self-publishing, someone like Rupi Kaur, who published, self-published and illustrated Milk and Honey, um, that would go on and become like a huge hit. And yeah. the other books that she will publish after that, um, 
you know, New York Times bestselling list poetry. I mean, I yeah. mean, who in a, who would have thought? That's yeah. but something just takes on, um, it, it's just like a fire, you know. It just mm-hmm. all of a sudden everybody, and you have a waiting list of like a couple hundred people for a poetry book, and you're just stunned. And it's so exciting to see. Yeah, and, and I was really excited about that because I love seeing that, and then helping younger women come in to the library looking for her books or someone similar to read. Mm-hmm. Um, is great because I think it's, you know, regardless if you like her poetry or think it's great or whatever, um, that's not really the, for her, of course, it's, she wants everyone to like it, but it's the possibilities that poetry is opening up a world for other people, for other mm-hmm. women to maybe tap into emotions or things that they would like to get down on paper or, you know, on Instagram or someplace. Um, So it was fascinating to see and kind of exciting Mm -hmm. um, to see. Um, One of the people that I really started to enjoy was Amanda Lovelace. Um, She has a series called Women Are Magic, um, which are just, they have fun titles. Mm -hmm. um, And I've enjoyed every single one of those. I don't know what number she's on right now, but... um, of just empowering, uh, yeah. you know, sort of em- w- women's empowerment <laughs> kind of yeah. poetry, I guess. Um, yeah, so really fun. And uh, so it was cool to see that there were people looking for stuff like that. Um, Looks like you brought a couple of titles. I did. So, um, of course, I brought uh, Mary Oliver, um, which I just, and this is the one, uh, the title was Felicity. Uh, by Mary Oliver. Um, This actually came out in 2016. It's not new, not a new, of course, she's passed away. Mm -hmm. Um, But just amazing poems. um, And someone that I look at quite often, like I said, you know, for emotional things, for emotional purposes. Yes, your Um, emotional support poet. Yes. And then a local uh, writer and uh, poet, um, Crystal uh, Wilkinson's Perfect Black, which um, I really enjoyed. Um, and so, of course, she's local. To, mm-hmm. uh, she's here in, in Lexington, um, which it's great. Give her give her a read. Yes, for sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, do you have – oh, did you bring any – oh, you I, brought – I did. I brought <laughs> – just so I – wouldn't forget it, but I brought Ovid's Metamorphoses. Oh, okay. And um, the Iliad by Homer. And the Metamorphoses is just a really interesting thing to read because it's all about transformation. It, it leans really heavily on Greek mythology. He's a Roman poet. And then later he kind of gets into a couple of original Roman things, which of course the Romans took most of their mythology from the Greeks. Right. So, um, but it's really interesting. Like the first set of books are about transformations caused by the gods. But then the second half is really even more interesting because it's transformations that humans undergo on their own. Oh, okay. So it's very, very interesting. I really enjoy it. I was thinking about something like this, and I think about people I know um, who they love uh, Beowulf. Yeah. Um, And that's something that... I think they're still studying. I mean, it's just amazing. And of course, you know, go ahead. No, and that hits on a completely other thing is how to translate poetry from one language to another and keep the rhythm and keep the meaning and the art that the original poet put into it is like a whole separate art that is just as important to be able. You have to be very talented to translate and keep what made it special in the first place. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine. Um, and we should note that, um, the poet laureate actually is from Kentucky. Oh yes. Um, yes. Ada Lamone. Ada Lamone. So I just f- finished her book of poetry, lucky wreck, uh, which I would highly recommend. Um, I know that the library has, a, a, I would believe a couple books of her poetry. Um, 
And if we don't have one that you want, just use that suggest a purchase form and we yeah. will get it as long as it's available to us. Oh, yeah. More poetry, the better. Yes. <laughs> Please enjoy readings from two of our past guests. Reading from her book, WWJD and other poems, it's Fan is Simple. And Danny Kentos is reading from her book, Two Brown Dots. Various poems might contain heavy emotion and themes, so listeners should be advised. Yes, and we have also chaptered them, so if there is a poem that you'd like to skip, you can. Yes. Please enjoy. Pork belly. Imagine you clutch the carving knife, slice it under and against your own ribs. One cut for every time they call you fat. Take that meat. Preserve it with salt to season your beans. Pinto, green. In your hands, a bucket. The fat sloshes, hot grease you collect in coffee cans, glass jars, your dreams dripping off your meat. This is poverty. You save every drop. Tell me, how many people you trying to feed? A list of times I thought I was gay. One. I gave a girl a handwritten copy of Peter Cetera lyrics, and it hurt me when she left them in another girl's desk. Two. I wrote a letter to my sports idol. I wanted to be like her, a girl the boys feared on the court. Three. Whenever she made me wear a dress. Four. I wore shorts and knee socks to the school dance instead of a skirt. My friends laughed. A cute older boy asked me to dance, and his friends laughed. Five. In the locker room, surrounded by sports bras and ball shoes, I felt no different. I looked. Six. I cut myself with a straight razor. Seven. In the kitchen at church camp, I cleaned dishes in three sinks. Soap water, bleach, rinse. Week after week for years, I never felt clean. Eight. I wanted to hug someone. I did not trust myself to hug someone. Nine. Boxing class, my body sore, my muscles alive. Ten. When I saw you clothed, 11, and imagined you naked, 12, when I saw you naked, 13, when I let myself hug you and my mind and your arms found my body and we were clothed and naked at once, 14, I realized if I wore makeup, if I wore dresses, she thought it meant I was straight. 15. When the youth pastor decried our friend might be dating a woman, my face flushed. 16. When I wore my hair in a faux hawk, then washed it out immediately. 17. Every time I wanted to buy a new tie. 18. When I noticed your tight sculpted shirt to your breast, your abs, your jutted out hips. 19. Every time a friend got married and I went without a date. 20. The first time I said, I'll never marry a man, then cried when I realized I didn't have to. And the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was fat. In the beginning, I was fat. In the beginning, I was lean and long, carried two weeks past due, and wore preemie clothes. And then I chunked up. Baby fat. A fat baby. Baby, I grew big, grew big boned, grew six inches taller than the other little girls, grew hips and thighs and breasts before my time. In percentile on all the doctor's charts, I grew. I knew I was too large, too loud, too mouthy for boys. I knew, even then, I loved girls. I knew, I knew, 
I knew by how loud the boy said no. I wanted them to say no. I wanted them to say yes. I wanted to feel like I could stop burying myself in my body. My body grew large. My body grew larger. A walk-in closet. I stood on the inside, hiding behind dresses. On the outside, Bible verses and Jesus. Men who made sure I heard them tell me my body was not my own. My mind was not my own. But it was, it was, it was. So I started to drag myself out. I kicked that door open. I kicked it down. Haven't looked back. Look, don't look back. Don't look back at the beginning. And the beginning was that word. And that word was God. The word is not God. I am God. I am that word. I am God's word. I am still fat. Scary Spice. She was in my fourth grade class, shy and curly-headed, her face red with crying that first day, her mom steering her shoulders to the coat closet. Her seat was next to mine, our names laminated and taped down. I asked which Spice Girl she would be. I always wanted to be Ginger, but got bullied into being scary since I was the only brown girl playing. At recess, she started telling stories about how much she was from Kentucky, unlike me. Great, great grandparents, all buried in this town, and where were mine? My family was friends with Henry Clay, loud enough for everyone on the bus to hear after a field trip to Ashland Estate. We'd seen hairsprayed raspberry pastries in the kitchen, set up to look like the Clays were on their way downstairs. The smokehouse the slaves' quarters, the elaborate garden, a wall of hedges. My grandpa played on the UK basketball team coached by Adolf Rupp, she bragged in the car as we passed Rupp Arena. I didn't have brags like this, didn't even know my dad's dad's name. All I knew that got passed down was from the summer we flew to the Philippines when I was six. My Lola showed me how to kill a chicken with a hatchet, knocking the blade against its wound in slow taps, how we let the neck bleed into rice. First milk. After all that birth, the legs you've used your whole life are now wobbly, and the lake where your son used to swim trickles from between them. The spaces between your fingers feel sticky. The first thing the baby does is search for the warmth of you, his face a small suction cup for the mounds you've been building. Those first golden drops, thick as honey, spill from you, and the nurse rushes to catch them with a plastic spoon. God forbid they soak your hospital gown or run down your rib cage. Once you were a girl with two breasts like the smallest constellation, an incomplete ellipsis. Today, they find new purpose. Today, they are nourishment and comfort, food, water, some kind of magic. They work so hard after years of thinking themselves merely decorative. Rosa de Rosario, 1929. The only photo of my Lola's mother, Rosa, sits in a gold curved frame on her dresser and always has. Rosa's round face looks like mine, like my Lola's, like my Lola's sister's, like my sister's. She holds a bouquet of white roses and wears a dark turno with butterfly sleeves, a pendant necklace, and rings. She stares straight into the camera's eye, but I can't quite tell if she's no nonsense or about to crack a smile. A crease in the photo divides her in half at the waist, and as a girl, I always thought it was a waterline. That somehow this photo was my great-grandmother in an impossible aquarium. A spiky urchin sits at her feet, and anchovies circle her ankles. She is half submerged, and a fish-like tail could be covered by her long skirt. Thanks for listening to Turning the Page, a podcast brought to you by Lexington Public Library staff. If you've enjoyed listening, please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, 
Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any questions or suggestions for future podcasts, you can email us at elibrarian at luxpublive.org. That's elibrarian at L-E-X-P-U-B-L-I-B dot org. I'm Jennifer, and we'll be back to turn another page.